I'm Tom Allen. I'm the Executive Director of Summit Behavioral Health. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about uh, the project overall, addiction needs in the state of New Jersey, and a little bit about what an IOP is, and, and even more importantly, the work that goes into uh, getting an IOP up and running in the state. Addiction is something near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm a person in, in recovery. Um, went through a difficult road. Uh, my, my background um, came from a, a, a home where uh, my father was an alcoholic and it took uh, a number of years before um, he got help and, and uh, he's doing well today, uh, but it did have its impact on my life. One in nine New Jerseyans have a problem with drug or alcohol uh, themselves and six in ten New Jerseyans know somebody that's directly impacted by addiction, whether it's a family member, whether it's a, a, a friend, a coworker. Uh, so it's all around us, and, and it really affects all aspects of, of, of our life. It's a huge drain on, on health care. It's a huge drain on, on social services. And left untreated, it's, a, it's an epidemic. So it's been about two years since I, I had the idea of doing my own program and being able to put the right group of investors together, being able to meander the state licensing process, um, fitting out a commercial space. Uh, right now the space that we're in for our first location is about 4,000 square feet. Uh, construction, arranging that, arranging the cost for it so that it's ADA compliant, compliant with uh, state regulations. Um, making sure that the permits are filed, the licensure uh, application was filed and, and, and following up on that, and then setting up a referral basis for, uh, for our clients. We're going to do a full continuum of care ranging from outpatient services to residential to detox. Um, hopefully we'll have three sites up and running in the next 15, min 15 months. and really uh, really try to make an impact and, and, and bring you know some more options to New Jersey residents. We're a holistic model and really we want to try to tailor the program to the individual instead of having the individual tailor their ideology or their um, their way of thinking to the program we want to meet them where they're at and truly identify what what that is and and work with them and in, in their ability to change and, and figuring out what that process is for them and to me, that's very important, that it, that it has to be meeting the individual where they're at and to ensure a, a, a greater success rate. When Dr. Walsh and I decided to put this program together, was offering a number of ad adjunctive therapies. Uh, we do music therapy, uh, art therapy, we're setting up pet therapy, massage therapy for the clients, uh, Reiki. And we're, we're trying to expose them to many different uh, resources so that they have the tools and, and, and the skills that they're going to need to live a happy, healthy, rewarding life. We have a local artist who is doing uh, the paintings for the facility, and he's also going to work as our art therapist. And I thought, how cool would that be to have somebody walk in and see a painting a, a professional done by a professional artist and then be able to sit down in, in an art therapy group with the artist and, and really uh, parse what the, the concepts were in creating the painting and, and being able to pick his brain a little bit. And maybe somebody finds a, a hidden talent or a laden talent that they, they didn't know existed. So, you know, maybe the next uh, famous artist is, is going to walk through these doors. Addiction affects people from all walks of life, professionals, teenagers, everyone. It's not just some person that's sitting on a street corner. It's many professionals and um, we can reach out and we can help. Don't forget, it, it, it affects families all over. My passion is to help families and the hurting and I really want to reach out to those in need and let them know that there is hope for their recovery. I've seen it for 20 years. I've seen people come from the bottom of the pit, feeling hopeless, to back on their feet, getting a job, having their own life, and being a family member again. When they come in, they would see me first. I would be their first point of contact. And they'll sit down with me and explain what's going on. And everything is handled in a professional and confidential way, although we are very warm and down to earth as well. And what we'll do is we will help them and guide them. I will 
first talk to the family about what their needs are and we also reach out to the family members as well so if the mother or the father or the the siblings need to be have some type of therapy and support that's what we're all about it's not just about the client um, in recent years the the role of psychological factors um, in the development of addiction has been increasingly recognized the, uh, people not only become addicted chemically to the drugs uh, that is their brain chemistry has changed uh, sometimes they become physically dependent in the sense that they'll go into withdrawal if they stop using, uh, certainly that contributes to the perpetuation of alcohol and drug use if somebody is physically addicted. Mm -hmm. But um, we also now realize that addiction is also a self-medication disorder. That people are using alcohol and other drugs as a way of managing their feelings, particularly disquieting or discomforting thoughts and feelings, and that relying on alcohol and other drugs as a way to cope uh, is part of what uh, sends somebody down that path towards addiction. Well, medication can have a number of different roles in treating addiction. Uh, certainly for people who come in physically dependent, uh, they need to be placed on a medication that will allow them to medically withdraw or de detoxify from uh, that safely and comfortably. Many people can do that on an outpatient basis. Uh, some people do need to go into an inpatient uh, detox program. It depends on the seriousness of the addiction, uh, the, how high a dose they're dependent on, and their ability to cooperate with a prescribed medication regimen. So people who come in dependent on alcohol, for example, um, uh, somebody who's seriously dependent on alcohol often needs to be detoxed on an inpatient basis because alcohol withdrawal, contrary to popular opinion, is one of the most dangerous uh, withdrawals. Uh, to do on your own and to stop abruptly. Opiate withdrawal, that is uh, withdrawing from prescription painkillers like uh, Oxycontin, Roxycontin, uh, Vicodin, Percocet, which are among the most uh, common uh, drugs that are abused these days. Uh, often people can be switched onto a transitional medication known as Suboxone, uh, which keeps them out of withdrawal. Suboxone does not get them high, allows them to make the transition off of the compulsive pill taking to taking a prescribed medication once or possibly twice a day and then to uh, when they're ready to be weaned off of that and the withdrawal from Suboxone is much smoother uh, generally much easier uh, for people to get through than uh, trying to wean themselves off, off of taking the pills. Um, we do not believe that there is one pathway to recovery for everybody. Our philosophy is to individualize the treatment based on the uh, patient's needs uh, to try to, quote, start where the patient is rather than where you want them to be. Sometimes you have to start slowly with people on the front end, uh, ease them into treatment. Uh, at the beginning, the treatment must be engaging. The, the first and foremost goal of outpatient treatment um, is not to strong arm the patient into recovery, it's to get the person to come back. In a group, often we come in and it's, and it, and it's um, you know, who we sit down and we talk about who we are. Um, where we're at, if there's somebody new in the group, it's like an introduction, so everybody goes around and introduces themselves, mm -hmm. and uh, we give like a basic layout of like group rules, which are pretty much, they all focus around non, like non-shaming behavior, um, you know, not allowing everybody to feel as if they're accepted, you know, because they are, uh, mm -hmm. because what we have here at, at Summit is a, is a more, is not a more, it is a client-centered focused um, treatment. Because it's more important to be focused on where the person is at in their life and their journey towards recovery rather than having a set like cookie cutter um, curriculum that's only based on um, that takes no consideration of an individual. We try to encourage people to participate so that they can we try to draw them out because some people are gonna be really extroverted and some people are gonna be really introverted and you know the idea is to like maybe get a little bit uncomfortable and, like, and support each other as we do that, so that we can talk about the things that are important to us. Um, because the drugs and the alcohol are maybe the reason that why we're here, but there's so much more involved um, with getting better than just why did we use, what substance did we use, and where did it bring us. Uh, clients come in um, sometimes from having experience in other programs. I wouldn't nec necessarily say jaded. I would say that they come from a different mindset. Uh, often, you know, treatment has the best intentions, however, it may not uh, be the most effective um, and based in evidence-based treatment 
Um, and, and the evidence suggests that a person-centered treatment is the best type of treatment to have for an individual. Um, and, and, and traditionally, traditionally treatment you know, has gone from a more therapeutic community standpoint um, to you know, we're going to break you down and then build you back up to a we're going to meet you where you're at. We're going to empower you to do the things in your life um, that make you happy and fulfill you. And everything. So treatment went from uh, let's support and like we need to do something about this to let's, let's break people down because we know how to fix them and then build, build them back up to in the image of what we want them to be rather than let's empower somebody to do what they want to do in their life. Um, and, 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 and that doesn't mean that that was wrong. Um, it, 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 for, to me, it just means that it may be less effective than to approaching an individual where they're at. I got, I got uh, into recovery when I was um, 24 years old, and uh, my being in recovery means that I'm a better son, I'm a better brother, uh, I'm a better member of the community, I'm a better member of society as a whole, and uh, it has really helped me become a better person in general. It's given me the ability to graduate from, from co college with my bachelor's degree, with my master's degree, and move forward into doing the things that I love and uh, fulfilling all the dreams I have in my life. So I attempt to do that and help other people realize that that can happen for them as well, and then help them decide how they're going to get there and support them as they do that. We've got 160,000 or so people identifying themselves as needing treatment and not being able to access it. Well, that number is only going to grow larger in the next couple of years with the advent of for the Affordable Care Act. A lot of these, uh, these regulations and plans will be rolling out over the next two to, to six years and we're going to have all these additional New Jerseyans with health insurance, which is great. And we're going to have uh, Medicaid, Medicare expansion, so more people will be able to qualify for, for those options. The problem with that is the number of beds in New Jersey is, is staying relatively stagnant. There's not a lot of uh, programs out there uh, opening up right now. When I teach art, I like to uh, give opportunity to uh, the client to possibly create wh whatever and work in whatever medium they like best. So we could potentially work on a giant self-portrait this size. We could work in uh, pen, and, pen and ink. We could work in pastels. We could even work in ceramics or clay. So I would like to present uh, multiple mediums, which I have a background in from my... Uh, graphic design and illustration days when I was getting my degree back in the, in the 80s. But we could really go in any direction with uh, the fine art, which is to the liking of that, that particular patient. Making art and expressing your creativity, whether, it's, uh, whether you feel happy or whether you feel sad or whether you're releasing pain, uh, nobody can look at it and tell you that, it, that it's right or wrong. And uh, even people that only know how to make a stick figure, they're still expressing something. No two people are going to make the same stick figure the same way. So their expression is coming out, and it is a release. And teaching that and, and going through that process uh, will naturally make you feel yeah. better. My art has always been my salvation. My creating art on a daily basis has always been uh, what, I, what I know how to do and what, what really has uh, you know, kept me happy. So I, I, I know for a, a fact, hand on, that helping other people learn how to create art, and whether you're an artist or not, it's even I learned from I learned more about creating art by seeing people that aren't artists make art, and that's that's the beauty that I love. It. I see changes right away when I see people creating and expressing their their own creativity. Sure, I see confidence building. And I see release. Music therapy is a wonderful allied healthcare profession and it's focused on goals so what what the patients and the clients need is what we work on. Um, within a behavioral health or chemical dependency setting we're working on team building, group cohesion, realization of of the issues you're coming through, working through the emotional stuff that comes with with an issue such as, as chemical dependency. And we do all this through music. So sometimes we're learning to write music so that we can express ourselves. Sometimes we're playing music and discussing how we fit into a community. Sometimes we are discussing music that we've used in the past that maybe needs to play a new role in our lives now that we're not 
using drugs. Another really cool aspect of music therapy is that a lot of these things can help you develop coping skills. So we're not just doing the music in the session and going home. A lot of these things that we're doing together as a group can be adapted so that a patient or a client can use it on their own at home for all the things that they need in coping, whether that's journaling through music or um, playing instruments with, with music or sitting and meditating with, with a musical theme in the background. And all of these things can be adjusted for those clients because we want them to have the skills and, and the ability to do this not just while they're sitting in group in their outpatient setting, but also when they go home to their families or to their apartments and that they need to um, be able to develop those skills on their own so that they don't, so that they have more of a chance of, of staying clean and staying uh, where they want to emotionally and, and mentally and, and in their health. I will be working with clients um, in group sessions and on one on one, on one and we will be um, looking at their diet and their lifestyle and their nutritional needs. Um, so it's going to be a lot of, it's not just all going to be about food and nutrition, it's also going to be about lifestyle choices and looking at the whole individual. Which people um, who are dealing with addiction issues, they're usually not producing enough amino acids. And so because of that, they're not producing enough, um, your neurotransmitters are not working. And so then you're dealing with things in the brain. So certain foods, such as greens, um, whole grains, um, so we're talking complex carbohydrates, your brown rice, your quinoa, your buckwheat, um, and there's so many simple recipes for that. High quality proteins, a lot of water, and another huge thing is sleep. But in order for people with addictions to get their restful sleep, they have to be producing enough amino acids to produce the neurotransmitters, or to get the neurotransmitters working properly again. And so you look at serotonin, and um, whole grains are huge for helping to produce the, increase your levels of serotonin in the brain. Um, so it all, it all ties in together. It all ties in. Just for example, uh, greens. Greens are huge for detoxing your liver, your kidneys, and there's so many. We go, I'll be doing cooking classes and um, just simple things though, where you, you know, blender, um, where you put greens in it, where you can't even taste the greens, um, and how to cook with them. And so it, it, it doesn't have to be difficult, it can be very easy. You can get it from your local grocery store, and a simple thing like greens helps to stabilize your blood sugar and helps to detoxify the organs in your body, which helps to speed up your recovery process and, and keeps you feeling in balance, and when everything's in balance, you make good choices. I was very emotionally stunned as a result of my, my addiction. I needed to learn how to live life all over again, and I didn't know, I, I didn't know how to grocery shop for healthy foods, and I had to learn that. My philosophy is that we want somebody to, to have those resources, be exposed to as many different things as possible so that they're, they're able to, to, to have a rewarding life. It's a process, like everything else, you know, going and um, food, but it can be fun. Life's supposed to be fun. Health, your career, your relationships, it's, it's just all, like, we're meant to live our life. You know, there's no dress rehearsals in life, this is it. So. As much as people think, oh, nutrition, it's just solely about the food, it's not. It really isn't. But choosing good foods and healthy foods that make you wake up and you're not tired and you're ready to start your day and you feel good about yourself, it just, it, it just falls right over into all other areas of your life. And it, it's just wonderful. A lot of uh, younger uh, adults that come into recovery think that their world's over because they're they're not able to hang out with their friends and go to the bars. They're not able to go to concerts anymore. They're not able to do this. They're not able to do that. And my whole thing is that I want to empower somebody so that they feel that they can make healthy choices. They can go to a concert and stay sober. They can do all these things, but they do them sober. And then for them to learn that they can have fun doing these things, it's, it's really, really rewarding for them.